So, Martin James Bobbitt, thank you for coming on to my podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here at the Learn Sound Club. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Thank you for having me. No, it's a pleasure to have you in such a busy schedule of your career. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd just like to set the context of our conversation today with a seemingly simple question on the outside, but on the inside, probably a quite difficult question. What is the responsibility? of a concert pianist, both off and on stage? Well, it, of course, that's a very challenging question to yeah, answer. That's a big one for a start. Yeah. I think music has the capacity to make empowerment and things like this possible through political movements. Um, and I think that's a wonderful thing when it happens. I also think it needs to be a possibility that, that music can transcend politics and doesn't necessarily always have to have a political meaning. I think, of course, we have some sort of responsibility to be on the right side of history. I think everyone does now and to, and to know when they see injustice and to speak up for it. Um, especially with what we've seen recently, though, with the Russian-Ukrainian uh, conflict, um, I've seen so many different sides to it and of course the conflict itself I'm very much against and I'm very much in support of, of all of my Ukrainian friends but also my Russian friends who have lived under this tyranny for so long. So I've seen competitions ban Russian competitors, I've seen other competitions welcome Russian competitors and I think it's very challenging to decide where you need to be. Personally I feel everyone should be welcome. Um, and I saw an interesting case of a Canadian festival where there's a young Russian pianist who, who had spoken out to a degree. He had said that he really he wanted the conflict to be over. But this is a, an 18 year old pianist and he was banned from coming to give this recital because he didn't speak out enough for us in the West to, to think that he wasn't involved in it somehow. And the point is his family live in Moscow and his grandmother lives there. And I think music can have a wonderful political stance and there sometimes you have to use it, but we also have to see the intricacies behind it and see that for him, that was not a comfortable position to be put in because he doesn't want to endanger the lives of his family for a concert. So it's a very hard time you've asked me this question. I will always try and stand up for what I think is right, but I also don't necessarily think it's a musician's job to lecture people on how to live their lives because I think music in some ways should transcend um, all of these things and it could just be a beautiful art form on its own without intent. That's a good answer. <laughs> so that's on stage, would you say? Or is that a general all-round responsibility on and off as well? I think. I think there is a responsibility, of course, to be compassionate and kind. And I think that's a responsibility of not being a musician, but of being human. So I would say it's a fine line between um, being somebody who is always constantly politicizing everything you do, um, but also you have to be in this day and age politically active because there are so many atrocities and terrible tragedies going on in the world that people need to stand up for one another. But I think that's more of a responsibility of being a human being rather than being a musician. Yes. I think the responsibility of an artist is to create wonderful music. And if that can help and make some impact, uh, then that's also wonderful. Yeah. Just to keep on that uh, influence of social and political stuff. Throughout one's artistic development, do we have any control over that or is that at the whim of our environment. So how we develop as musicians, do we have any control over how we develop? For example, if we focus more on this type of repertoire that we want to go in, we want to be um, developing in that sort of way, or we can possibly introduce new repertoire that we haven't done before because we want to develop in that particular way. How much agency do we have in how we develop ourselves as artists? Well, I think there's a, a, a balance point that changes as, as you evolve and you grow. I think when you're younger, you need strong guidance to 
make sure you're playing things that are suitable for you, you know, physically, technically, emotionally, maturity. All of these elements, you need to find someone who can carefully hone um, your art with you and guide you in the correct fashion. And then of course, at a certain turning point, which is different for everyone because it depends when sort of you become more independent in yourself, you then think, well, actually, you know, I, I really haven't particularly enjoyed the Hannon exercises and the churning exercises, so maybe I'll try something else. And you evolve and decide whether you want to be a specialist, as lots of people are, a French specialist in Debussy or Ravel, or whether you want to have a more encompassing view, which is the route that I decided. I wanted to try and play a bit of everything because I, I love music across all um, the ages. So as time comes, that balance shifts and then you become more in control of your choices. And of course, at some point you become teacherless. Um, and if that balance has changed and happened over a period of time, and by the time you've studied with your last teacher, you have an independence, it makes it far easier to go into the big wide world, um, knowing that you have some capacity to make correct decisions yourself. So it, it changes as, as you grow, and that's the way I think it should be um, if you're in a good institution or with a good professor and such. Because you said you've had a wonderful career thus far. Um, these days, do you have a guide, like a mentor, guiding you through your career right now, or is it off, off of your own back at the moment? Well, I've always remained very close to my teachers. So my mother first taught me, and of course I remain close to her on a higher <laughs> level. <laughs> no, teacher and student relationship. Yeah. So um, she's always taught me and she's always supported me. And now she doesn't um, support me in terms of, you know, sort of telling me what to do musically, but she supports me in making my career possible and, and helping me out in all those wonderful ways. Mm -hmm. My teacher after her was Emily Jeffrey, who I had at the Royal College of Music, and I had her for 10 years and they were very intensive, instructive, and inspiring years um, that really sort of formed my character as a musician and um, the things I liked and the things I disliked. And then I, of course, went on to study with Vanessa Natash and did my undergraduate, my postgraduate, my fellowship, my artist diploma under her tutorage, um, tutelage, sorry, I might say, and um, she was wonderful because she gave me the independence that I um, needed. And she sh showed me that I could form all these thoughts and these uh, interpretations and all of this phrasing, all of these things myself. And at one point I would have to uh, be able to do all of that and stand on my own two feet and look after myself. So she really gave me that final push that I needed. And now I, I remain close with all of them, and I. One person who's a big uh, mentor is Sir Andra Schiff, who I played for quite a few times now, and he has always inspired me because he's so kind and so generous off stage, as well as on stage, and he is somebody who I, I have always looked up to and will always look up to. And if I need help with something, I I feel incredibly lucky that I think he would help me. So. <laughs> Um, that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> what, was those, what were those masterclasses like with Sir Andrew Schiff at the Royal College of Music? So the first one I had was at the Royal College of Music and it was terrifying. Um, because I'm playing for one of the greatest pianists in the world, but also one of the greatest Schubert players. And I'm playing the Schubert Impromptus, which are perhaps the most famous pieces of Schubert uh, for the piano. So it was, I was terribly nervous and I, I, I don't think I played particularly well. I think I, I played fine, um, but it was working with him afterwards that it sort of grew beyond what I could imagine before me. You know, I came on with these pieces that I believed I had worked incredibly hard on and they were ready and they were good to go and I would have happily played them in any concert setting. And then I played them to him and realized that there were just dimensions and dimensions and dimensions you know, further than what I'd ever imagined before. And that's something that I always find when I play for him. He then invited me to Salzburg um, and I played in the Mozarteum and I played the Genome 
piano concerto with the camerata, the orchestra there, and he was in the audience and then he gave the master class on stage and it was a place where Mozart spent a lot of time. It, that was, you know, just beyond spending time with him, but being in that situation, in that environment is immensely inspiring. And then I, I played with him in Verbier of Bach and every time I've left with more jewels and incredible knowledge uh, to take with me. Was there one thing he said to you that once receiving that wisdom you were never the same again? Um, well, he said many funny things. I mean, which, which were not necessarily, you know, what I take with me. But um, I, his interpretations, the way he described, the descriptiveness of the way he teaches, you know, to think of sort of like a babbling brook or something like that in the middle, but just very gently going along whilst this melody line soars over the top. And the idea of being able to sing the melody line, and if you can't sing the melody line over the top, you're probably playing it at an incorrect pace. Things like this, I sort of took with me, but also his sense of humor was something that I loved because we were doing so many serious things. You know, Schubert and Bach are very terribly serious and it's serious music, but to be able to have jollity and, and, and enjoy it was something that really stuck with me. Mm. Just, to, just to move away from music slightly, if we can. Um, you're a pianist by trade. Um, do you have anything that you do that's equally as expressive as music that's not music, that to express yourself? Well, I, I don't know whether I would go so far as to say equally. Sure. But the thing I probably get closest to music is, is cooking. It's been a love of mine for quite some time. And I, I might go so far to say that I can feel as happy on stage as I can in a kitchen, you know, and preparing things. And um, it's sort of similar in a way because you work so hard at all the prep work, you know, for your piano recital, and you do the same when you're cooking. And you have everything ready and you have everything ordered so that it can go, it can be a smooth process in both cases. And then you do the action of actually making it, which is where the artistry comes in. Um, and then at the end, you receive the applause, and that feels immensely good, of course, to, to the people who have appreciated you. And when you eat your dinner, you feel as if you're <laughs> reaping the benefits as well. So I, I sort of find the process is quite similar. And also the thing that is, I love listening to music whilst I'm cooking as well. So to me, they're kind of linked together. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm in the process of putting out a wonderful cooking show with my best friend, who is a tenor, Ben Johnson, and it's actually relating cooking and food to music. So we have lots of dishes inspired by Rossini and we sing Rossini songs and we have a gazpacho by Liberace and I play the Warsaw Concerto and it's linking all of these, because I do think they're intrinsically and inherently linked. Um, and I know lots of artists who adore eating more than really anything, you know. I think some people even look forward to the post-concert <laughs> dinners more than the concert themselves, which I don't, of course. But, um, <laughs> yes, that's something that I have an immense passion for and I really enjoy it in my, in my spare time. Were you always good at cooking? Was it something you had to work on quite a bit? It was something that I, after I won Beauty on Musician, I realised that I had a bit more pocket money, right? <laughs> Which is like, this is very, this is going to sound very first world, so let's just go. <laughs> and I went to a few lovely restaurants and I thought, oh, this food is so incredible, you know, why am I eating this dismal, vile things I create at home when this stuff is available? But, you know, it becomes quite an expense to eat in nice restaurants three times a day. <laughs> so I thought, well, I better learn how to do this myself. And I thought, it can't be that hard. You know, you just buy a book and you read it and then you attempt to do something similar and, and, mm -hmm. and I found that I had a passion for it and I think a, a modicum of flair, I'm not sure, but I, it's something that I really enjoyed. And creating an interpretation is something I love. You're taking a recipe like something like a ragu or something that is, there are so many different variations upon it, 
but then sort of finding over a period of time which ingredients you like the most and which things you add in to make your recipe and your dish individual is similar to how I think of music sometimes and all of the recordings we have of Horowitz and Murray Pryor and Alfred Brendelman, yeah, so forth. But to actually find your own way that you want to craft a piece is the way I feel about dishes. Do you have a signature dish? Um, uh, well, I love special. making pasta. pasta. I really like making homemade pasta um, and with all kinds of Italian sauces. I also love making pizza, like a really traditional, you know, Neapolitan pizza or something like this. Is I, remember, I love Italian food. Mm -hmm. um, so they're probably my favourite things to cook. Mm. Um, but I also love comfort food, you know, because after travelling and being in airports and all kinds of places that feel like they no personality or charm, <laughs> it's nice to come back and eat like a, you know, a huge whopping great slab of lasagna. I mean, what more do you want? <laughs> do you cook every day? No, I, I, if I'm at home and I'm practicing and preparing for recital, I probably will cook at least one meal a day. But when I'm traveling, it just becomes sadly impossible. Yes. Um, but I, I have a lot of time in May where I'm preparing a new program, um, which I'm very excited about, but I'll have a lot of time at home to get it ready and get it um, up and running. Therefore, I will be, I've, you know, I've already screenshotted recipes I've found <laughs> in the Telegraph and the Times that I want to try out. So I will be, you know, yes. at the butchers and the, and the grocery shops getting all those stuff. <laughs> In an interview with your friend Ben Johnson, you said um, you had a fear of being forgotten. And I found it very interesting because I related to it quite a bit. And it's something I think about a lot. Um, you might think that's a bit strange as a 25, 26-year-old, sorry. Um, do you still have that, that fear of being forgotten? I think the fear, I tr of course, one tries not to dwell on fears I mean there are many fears that I have um, I think I'm I would be worried if I felt like I would be forgotten amongst the people who I loved the most and who loved me the most but I I don't think I hope that that won't happen in that sense I don't mind if anyone else forgets me as long as the people who I cared about the most don't really, because then you, I can sort of live on through their memories and of, of our time together. So as long as my friends and my, and my family sort of think of me once in a blue moon, I think I, I wouldn't worry about it. I don't mind if I, my, I would, ho I would like my music to be remembered, but it's, that's people's choice. If they deem it w worthy enough, something to s stay in existence then it will and if it doesn't then i've had a bloody great time making music and experiencing all the things that come with it so in in that sense it's not up to me but as long as the people who i love still love me then i'm perfectly happy do you fear you know the d word death uh i more fear death <laughs> as a musician <laughs> yes I, yes <laughs> uh well i was speaking to a journalist about my last album which was love and death yes and they said oh those two four letter words and i thought <laughs> and i realized halfway through that i think she may have believed that it was titled love and death oh, which right. of course uh, <laughs> it's a very strange pun on music um <laughs> of course I, I i do yes and actually it was only last year that my grandmother passed away and she oh, passed away just before I went into a recording studio and recorded my most recent album, which was full of beautiful music, like The Man I Love and Embraceable You and things that are intimate and close and warming music. Um, but also, of course, when you've lost someone, it feels very nostalgic and, and not quite so warm. So, and that was scary. Because I've never, no one ever close to me has passed away before, luckily enough. 
So in that sense, it was a, a, an awakening that obviously nothing lasts forever, and it sounds very cliche to say, but it really doesn't. And that's what makes it so beautiful as well, and that's what makes music so beautiful, is that, forget recordings, but live concerts, which is the essence of making music, is happens and it's done. And all we have is the memory of the feeling that we felt during that time. And life is very similar, um, which makes me think, you know, get up, go out, do stuff, love, laugh, live, do all that kind of th stuff, because it's not going to last forever and it can vanish in a split second. Does so, that make... Does, sorry. No, 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 that's it. Does that make you enjoy the present a lot more? The feeling that... I think so. Moment. I think so. You have to. I think, and also, when times are tough and life is stressful, and you know, in the last few days, I've had the incorrect currency for taxis and been screamed at, and had doors slammed, and my case is lost, and you know, <laughs> all these kind of things that life, life, you can't control life, and when you try to control it, is when it goes out of control. Um, so, in that sense, you think, well, do you know, take a step back. Yes, I don't have my case. I have none of my worldly <laughs> belongings of which I need them. However, I'm in a, a good place compared to lots of other people. And uh, one needs to realize that even when things are tough, it can be tougher. So I've, I've, I've trying to be a bit more nonchalant about when things go dreadfully wrong, which I think is a, what, yes, everyone should try and do a bit, <laughs> is when things are really bad, just... Uh, try to see some glimmer of hope in anything yeah <laughs> uh what has been the most difficult time in your career thus far a moment where it's a test of strength and character mm. i'm lucky because i haven't really had many difficult moments mm. i had hard moments when i was growing up with music you know because i played different instruments as well and mm. and there was always going to be a choice that i would have to make between whether i wanted to be a bassoonist or a pianist and and that was hard because you didn't want to disappoint one teacher and and you know and, and ruin that relationship that you had so that's probably been my hardest thing has been finding my own artistic voice and finding my first of all my instrument then my voice and they're my interpretation. Um, so that's something I think takes time, but you have to go through that process and that evolution of self. Otherwise, you don't have a strong voice of your own. Mm. Uh, I have to ask the last question now. I wish we can talk for much longer mm. on this podcast. I'm really enjoying it. Um, is there a piece of music that obviously wasn't written for you, but emotionally and physically it was as if it could have been written for you in mind well the pieces that i probably resonate most with are not for the piano damn <laughs> so <laughs> like richard strauss for example mm -hmm. i find his sound world so evocative i mean it just moves me to my core to hear richard strauss so the four last songs, Rose and Cavalier, these pieces I just inspire me. In terms of piano music, I think I love Liszt. I love everything about Liszt. I love his life. I love what he did in his life and the journey he went through. And, and I love his deep appreciation of other people. He was a very kind artist and he loved Schumann. He loved Bach. Um, he loved many, he loved Wagner. And I think his love of other people, his generosity, his charitable nature, I found very inspiring. And one of the pieces that I love to play, and I'm sure somebody one day will say, well, please stop playing that piece, <laughs> um, is Widmung, the Schumann transcription, because it has the flair and the artistry that Liszt brings, but it also has a deep respect and um, inspiration from Schumann and Sch Schubert and Ave Maria at the end. It, it's wonderful because it seems to have so many people's presence in one piece. And to play all of these 
geniuses at once, uh, there's nothing quite like it. Martin James Barlett, thank you very much. Thank you.